Alora Calzadilla. Intervals. Philadelphia Museum of Art. Intervals. In this case, they're talking both history, is the history of art, right, the history of objects, and the history of music. And music, right. the musical interval, the right. time interval. Indeed. A choral group made up of 12 people Indeed. walking back and forth, and at some point they did this amazing thing, which is actually sing and move backwards. So when they were moving backwards, they were singing backwards, they were actually singing Haydn's creation. <laughs> show, as far as I'm concerned, is about a failure of communication, ideas that don't cohere, and that interests me. The thing is resolved properly, to get back to a universal enlightenment notion of art making, and that's what interests me. Uh -huh. It's rupture, but it's synthesized in such a way that that actually allows us to sort of enter in and get it, right? And this show is made up of two performances, right, that cycle through, and a set of... Three uh, videos. Three, three videos. Big projected videos. Very impressive emotionally. The great thing is that they're perceptually incredibly rich. Who doesn't love hearing a guy who's got the deepest voice on the planet, right? So there's obviously, there are those ways in that are all about the uh, sheer perceptual pleasure. You may wind up convincing me with this, with this show. Well, let's go in there and respond to some of the pieces. minutes ago there was a performance in here, 11 musicians playing a serenade that was written in 1798 for the two elephants whose bodies are preserved in the museum that he's wandering through. That was the, the height of the Enlightenment. That was about saying, we humans can communicate to the other species through the glories of our music. And it was kind of ridiculous. I mean, when you saw the musicians in here, it was so clear that no elephant could give a shit about what they were playing. No, it's like putting recordings up in space, yeah, basically. Yeah, that's right. So that kind of undermining is interesting to me, and I think it's in the whole show. A notion of undermining the whole premise that there can be that kind of orderly communication between past and present. I'm frustrated by some of the sort of postmodern approaches. The issue with this work in general is that it is very complicated stuff. And there's no two ways around that. Yeah. You know what, the fact that we're hesitating and that we're less brilliantly eloquent than we normally are today is actually in praise of this work. <laughs> it's forcing us to come to grips with it and that's, that's hard. I see this setup and rather than sort of see the absurd, first of all, I see sort of like, an academic version of the absurd. I wish I saw Eraserhead more than I actually see a professor teaching Eraserhead. A professor discussing anything is bound to be boring. The problem with postmodern theory is that it's effing boring. It is. And this isn't, this is captivating. This is, and that's what's good about art. Non-paraphrasable art just draws you in and forces you to do something with it. But also because the artists have basically sort of built in um, some loose bits um, some lack of connections and communication, and, and, and that makes the piece stronger. I'm willing to say that whatever intellectual frustrations I have from the over-intellectualism I read into this work, I will actually give up to the significant pleasures of even these video pieces and certainly to the choral piece that we saw. The work bests, I think, those kinds of frustrations, which now seem to be superficial. It overcomes its own pretensions. It, that's it, pretty good. That's very good. Which is a hard thing to do. As saying, from the point of view of a guy who's pretentious, it's hard to overcome it, you know? Usually you just wallow in your own pretension. Yeah, well, you know? yeah, it's, I still like you when you drink your tea with a little finger up. Right.